My name is Tara McGinnis, and I am delighted um, to invite you into the physical and virtual space that is New America. For folks who are unfamiliar um, with New America, we are a Washington, D.C. based think and action tank um, dedicated to revitalizing the promise of, of the ideals of America and the digital age. We could not be more excited about our guest today. Um, across New America, we have a number of teams that are focused on bringing um, all aspects of public life and pub uh, public policy into the digital age. We have teams that work uh, digi on digital governance. We have teams that work on bringing technologists into government. We have a team um, that I lead called the New Practice Lab that focuses on how we use technology for family um, uh, economic security. But here today, um, there are a few people who I've learned as much from um, as the, the Minister of Digital Governance in Greece over the past year. And so I'm, we're going to turn most of the session over to, to him to hear some um, presentation or remarks and then dive into questions about your work and what the implications are for the United States. Um, I can't say enough about how grateful we are to be here, but also the kind of the fellowship and learning. So I want to say a few um, moments about uh, Kariakos Pierakakis, the Minister of, um, of Digital Governance in Greece. First, um, in a very unique capacity, he is both a computer scientist and a political scientist, um, someone who has been leading on both the technology side as well as the vision. Um, and the work that's been taking place, you'll hear more about from him but has been an inspiration, not only in the forward looking nature about how you can smooth the life experience of free citizens, but also in how you can build trust in government along the way. And I think um, having picked up the New York Times at some point in 2020 and, and read a headline uh, suggesting that in, the, in a surprising way, Greek citizens are very satisfied with their government's COVID response. I, um, I was inspired to speak to you and the team about the work. So I'm gonna turn it over um, for a presentation uh, and, and let's hear more about your work directly. But thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great joy to be here. Uh, needless to say, and let me kick off by saying that, uh, your book, the book that uh, Tara Dawson McGuinness and Hannah Shank wrote uh, on public interest technologies, power to the public, has been an inspiration uh, for the Greek government, for myself personally, for my team, and it's actually mandatory reading for my team. So uh, thank you so much for this, and uh, it's a great joy to be here at the New America Foundation. Uh, the work that we have been trying to do is very much uh, in parallel with what you have been trying to describe in your book, how governments haven't been provisioning public services in the manner in which uh, would be ideal for citizens. And thus, what we have been attempting to do in the last three years in Greece is effectively to change the way citizens are served in the context of their life events. This means that life events are structured basically from the government's perspective, from the state's perspective, rather than from the citizen's perspective. And technology can enable you to change this. This is your vision. Uh, this is our vision. And this is what we have been trying to attempt. Uh, let me begin by quoting two numbers, the change in two numbers of our KPIs, our key performance indicators, to showcase what we have achieved in Greece in the last three years. Uh, the first one is the number of digital services provided. Uh, and there we started effectively having learned a lot from the UK experience, from the government digital service of the UK in 2011, the gov.uk experience. We created a similar portal, gov.gr, uh, it took us nine months to develop it. And uh, what we wanted to do was to aggregate the pre-existing services of the Greek state to begin with. How many services do we have? Do they work well? Where are they? Should, they should be on a single point of reference. This took us nine months. We found out that we had 501 pre-existing services. We added two more on day one, so 503. The rule according to which we added services we said would be the Pareto rule, meaning that 20% of the services generate as a rule of thumb, 80% of the traffic. So effectively, we wanted the most frequently used services being the ones that we will start from. So 503 in March 2020, as of yesterday, 1,398 services. Uh, this means that if you look at the curve, it's effectively one service per day provided, including weekends. Uh, and that manifests the scale of the work conducted by our engineers, by our service designers, by our UX designers, by the people who are engaged in this project. Now, the second number, I think, is even more interesting. It's even more important. And it's digital transactions. Now, we can have a sense of how many times a Greek citizen 
interacted digitally with the Greek state, the tax service is excluded from this uh, analysis because this was digital even before us. We have uh, Greek citizens have to file their taxes digitally uh, for more than 10 years back. Uh, so Let's say that slowly, Greek mm -hmm. citizens have to file their taxes digitally, carry uh, on. <laughs> yes, uh, th that's, uh, that's a policy that started around 15 years ago and uh, it's a policy that remains to this day and it's a success because which is interesting here is that every Greek citizen has a digital ID for the tax system, which we then use, which we then instrumentalize for a series of other digital services. Now, we can have a sense of digital transactions effectively by adding two numbers up. The first number is how many times you logged in the systems. How many times you logged in the systems, either using the tax credentials that I mentioned, which we instrumentalize further, or the authentication of the banks, of the Greek banks which you have, which for which we have allowed use for access in our digital public services. We accept them as equivalent. The European Directive enables us to do so. So bundling those numbers is the direct logins. But there's also a second number vis-a-vis -vis how many times one is served, interoperability. Now, Estonia has X-Road. We don't have X-Road, but we have a version of it. We have an interoperability center. So the calls in the interoperability center are equal to a physical visit not made because the Greek state already has access to your data. You give us the green light, we obtain access to your data through the interoperability center. And effectively, this is the once only principle uh, that Estonia has originally conceived of. So by adding those two numbers up, you have a sense of digital transactions. So how, how did those transactions evolve in the last years? In 2018, there were 8.8 .8 million digital transactions. In 2019, there were 34 million. In 2020, there were 94 million digital transactions. And in 2021, there were 567 million digital transactions. And if you, do, if you look at the numbers, the curve is purely exponential. Now, COVID played a role, of course, in the usage of such, of such services because it was the demand catalyst. Governments had to ensure government continuity in the same manner in which uh, businesses had to ensure business continuity. But my claim here would be that it's the previous number, the availability of digital services in the core life events which was the driver for the exponential evolution of this number. Effectively, it was a supply, I would say, change primarily, and then a demand change. So over all those two numbers, if you look at any poll in Greece right now, in the policy areas uh, and the satisfaction uh, of each policy area, there's a consensus in Greece that digital transformation of the state was an unexpected reform. It was the vision of our prime minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, and it's a reform which we're delivering to citizens and where results are being made basically every day because one new service emerges every day. Now, the question is, how did we do this? Apart from how we plan to continue building in an agile manner, uh, the new services that we want to add every day. Well, the first lesson is preparation. We started more than a year prior to the, our national election. Our last national election took place in 2019. So imagine us starting mid 2018. The then leader of the opposition, now Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis, had personal experience on the, on the topic because he used to serve previously in a previous capacity as a minister of administrative reform. So e-government was part, as it was called then, it was part of his portfolio. But as he said to us, he felt that he had the remit, but he didn't have the tools uh, that he wanted. So effectively, when uh, the prime minister created his cabinet, in a very symbolic move, he decided to abolish the ministry that he previously ran to create a new digital ministry where effectively, while we were naming it and designing it, we knew that digital was not exactly the proper title because digital is the means, as you say in the book, it's not the goal. The goal is service design, the goal is public interest technology, the goal is to change the experience of citizens when they interact with the state. It's not about the technology, it's, it's, it's about the experience and about how to change things. So effectively, if we conceive of the state as three things, structures, processes, and human resources, we decided to get processes out of the traditional Ministry of Public Service or Interior, as we say, and create a ministry around process simplification, digitization, and telecom, of course, being part of that mix. So the Digital Governance Ministry was created. It took us a long time to learn the lessons from other places and the lessons from our previous experience. In that sense, we looked both at the horizon and at the landscape. Uh, the horizon being, okay, what is Estonia doing, being uh, the most digital uh, of states? We studied Estonia, of course, but we realized while we were studying it that it's more a compass rather than a map. Uh, it's the end result. It's, it's where we want to get 
but getting there, the, the path is not the same. The government digital service that I mentioned before was a closer example of the UK to the Greek experience. So we brought people over from uh, the government digital service to help our delivery unit and train them at the beginning. And in that process, we mapped all the digital organizations that existed previously in the Greek state up until 2019. As you can imagine, as is the experience in all places, the way digital evolved in the previous decades was that at some point, every department, every organization, every ministry in our case, had a digital department doing the digital things of that organization, digital education, digital health, et cetera, et cetera. Governments are traditionally good at vertical policies, but they're traditionally not as good at horizontal policy. So here we had to see, we had to understand how to deliver change at speed and at scale for a horizontal policy portfolio. That's a challenge. So we decided that one, we wanted to adopt a centralized model. For a country in the size of Greece, that made sense. Greece is 10.7, has a population of around 10.7 million uh, citizens. It made sense to have a very strong ministry of digital at the core of government. Another lesson that we learned uh, was that in the governments and in the countries where we had success at speed, it was primarily because at the end of the day, the project uh, had the remit, had the personal interest of the head of state or head of government, depending on the policy architecture of every country. So in our case, that was the case. Our prime minister had previous experience, as I mentioned. So we decided to build a very strong organization. So in effect, we knew previously that our cloud services, for instance, were part of the Ministry of Finance. Our delivery unit was an R&D center, which previously belonged to the Ministry of Education. We had another cloud and delivery unit together, infrastructure at the Ministry of Labor. So all these organizations, our election took place on July 7th, 2019. On the night of July 8th, uh, Monday, July 8th, 2019, all these organizations became part with a presidential decree of the new Ministry of Digital Governance. We were ready before, so the button was pressed 24 hours after the election and the new organization was created automatically. This played a huge role. And what also played a huge role were three policy decisions at the beginning, which in my view were extremely instrumental. The first one, and those decisions became part uh, of our legal system. They were passed parliament 10 days after uh, our new government was created. The first policy was the centralization of procurement. The new minister of digital governance was endowed with veto powers on all significant procurement on digital across the state on the basis of fitness with a digital strategy, which we would be developing. The second policy decision, in my view, the most critical, was rendering the Minister of Digital Governance Chief Information Officer of the state, not only in name, but in content. And by that, I mean that the Minister of Digital Governance in Greece has the capacity to interoperate any data set with any other, to interoperate any data in order to, in a sense, offer a better citizen's uh, experience in while we're trying to redesign life events. That was crucial. And the third one was that we made a, a decision that all data will be centrally stored on the governmental cloud, unless uh, we said so, unless we allowed uh, for that not to happen. So those three policy decisions happened at the beginning of our government's tenure. And in my view, politically, this was crucial in order to be able to then deliver the results. Of course, having the proper team on the ground also played a huge role. We, we instrumentalized that previous year in order to headhunt and in order to know whom uh, we would be collaborating with in the context of the Greek public service. This was again extremely important because we have extremely talented people within our public service and we empowered them with the creation uh, of this ministry. And then uh, we started delivering results. Nine months later, the government portal uh, was created. In our view, the core reform but uh, COVID came in exactly nine months uh, after uh, we, we were into office. And in reality there, we had a dilemma. There is this phenomenal essay, which I strongly suggest everyone reads. The prime minister and my team, interestingly enough, we read it simultaneously and we exchanged the essay on WhatsApp on that day. Uh, it's an essay by Yuval Harari on the FT at the beginning of the pandemic. It was interestingly named after the pandemic, even though the pandemic was just beginning. And there, uh, Harari points out the dilemma that governments will face, saying that from our experience, after a couple of years, the pandemic will be over, but what will remain 
are your policy choices on the primarily on the digital front this time? And there is a core dilemma between empowerment and surveillance, he says it as clearly. So our decision as a government was obviously uh, empowerment because if, in effect, we had a pre-existing strategy. The strategy was let's change the way citizens are served by the state. So we took that policy decision and we rendered it a tool to battle the virus as well because we knew that as we're digitizing public services in a state which is quite conceived as being bureaucratic traditionally with lots of steps on a life event, if you simplify and digitize at the same time, effectively you're eliminating interactions. And doing that during a pandemic, that's a strategy. So we did that. And uh, in reality, the core life events of citizens are currently a part of our government portal. I'll use one example vis-a-vis -vis how we have approached our work to showcase how similar it is to the philosophy that you point out in your book. Birth of a child. So prior to the portal, the first event that we decided to simplify and digitize symbolically was exactly this. So it was a five-step process up until February 2020. You obviously had to go to the hospital. You had to go to the citizen service center to get a social security number in Greece for the, for the newborn. You had to go to the pension fund uh, of one of the parents to have a, a social security enrollment uh, and coverage. You had to go to, the, to your local city, to your local municipality for registration, for the official registration. And we had added a fifth um, step, which is a stipend, which we offer 2,000 euro stipend for newborns on the basis of income. So five steps. And uh, parents are typically very happy uh, when they have a child, so they don't notice them. They notice them in, in other more problematic events of their life. But still, we figured that this was a great opportunity to prove the concept. So we, prove, we tried to prove the concept and we did the following. Now, when a child is born in Greece, parents receive two messages. The first message being congratulations and the social security number for your child is this. And the second message, or, or it can be an email. Uh, and the second message is whether or not they will be receiving the stipend telling them that it's automatically credited to their account. And in a sense, it's the first smart social policy uh, design that we have implemented. Uh, this work miracles. This is what we have been trying to do on all other fronts. On certain things, we have managed to simplify and redesign more quickly than simply digitizing, but COVID forced us to do a little bit of the latter as well. But still, the whole policy right now, I think, is uh, running at speed and at scale, as I mentioned. And to add another point to this, the vaccination process for us was a core, I would say, policy decision on the overall digital agenda of the government, because in reality, we viewed vaccination as a service design experiment. And this is exactly what was the decision of the prime minister and uh, of my team. We wanted to have a multiple channel approach. We wanted to have predictability that you would know when you would be vaccinated and where, and that when you went to the vaccination centers, you wouldn't experience long lines of people waiting. It would be maximum half an hour. And given the fact that this was the most difficult logistics exercise post-World War II, that was a challenge. We had to develop the system in seven weeks. Uh, Greek citizens view the vaccination system as a very big success, exactly, exactly because we managed to achieve this multiple channel approach, just namely, we had the obvious digital platform that worked where you could book your two appointments for the vaccine. We had the second digital platform, which was our e-prescription system. During COVID, we launched, we already had the prescription system, your prescription associated with your social security number, but only doctors had access to this, not citizens. And the doctors had to print the prescription and you had to then go to the pharmacy store with a printed piece of document. We changed that and you received your prescription on your phone with a QR code. So we said that if you're enrolled on that system, you don't even need to go on the platform. You will receive an SMS telling you what your proposed appointment is on the basis of your zip code. And on the basis, of course, of your other characteristics, your age and or your health condition, because the e-prescription system has historical data for 10 years and we can reverse engineer them on the basis of conditions. So our vaccination authority did that. So the two digital channels played a huge role but we didn't only have digital channels because service design is not only about digital. Digital is the means. We also had physical channels for those who are not digitally skilled. And there we either used the citizen service centers. We have a thousand in Greece where you could physically go and book your appointment. Or, and that was, I think, one of the best decisions that we made, instead of using call centers, which wouldn't work, 
and we saw them not working in many places around the world. We instrumentalized the pharmacy stores in Greece, which are 11,000. They have an SME structure, unlike the United States. And all pharmacy store owners are credentialed in the prescription system. So we said that if you don't want to book your appointment for the vaccine online yourself, you can go to your pharmacy store uh, in your village or in your city and have the appointment booked for you. So overall, it was a very coherent system, fully digital. And it's very interesting that, as again uh, is pointed out in the book, sometimes the simpler technologies play a more significant have a more significant impact. And when we discuss with citizens what has played the biggest role in their impression about change overall in the Greek state, they quote, uh, amongst other things, the, the SMS that they received when they received their first job of the vaccine, exactly because the system was fully digital, they automatically received an SMS notifying them about their second appointment. So many told us that this was exactly where I felt that my state is working really well and it's changing uh, in the process. Now, overall, this whole process, again, uh, this, those projects are a function uh, of the work of a very large team of a service delivery unit of, of contractors who have changed the way they operate within the context of our strategic priorities. Our digital strategy is public. It's called the Digital Transformation Bible. The document is interesting, it's in Greek, but uh, the document is interesting exactly because it's not solely strategic. It's an implementation plan which codifies 448 specific projects that are going to be implemented by 2025. They're not the only projects because of course, uh, we have crises, we have new priorities, but we will certainly fund these projects. And because it's not only about the screens of code, but it's also about the books of law, uh, we had our digital law, which passed the Greek parliament in September 2020. And uh, I would say that in a quite rare for our standards uh, manifestation of bipartisanship, the equivalent of 275 MPs out of 300, four political parties, uh, my party and three extra parties voted for that law. And in effect, it's the digital constitution of Greece. It includes all facets of digital, transposing European directives on telecommunications and open data, our governance on identity, digital identity, digital signatures, and the full scope of policies like the policy, the innovative policy that we have had on the deployment of 5G networks in Greece. Everything is within that law. And for us, it's extremely important, amongst other things, to answer the challenge of continuity, which is as we're reading the experience of other states amongst other places, the UK, we see that continuity of that policy is a huge challenge that needs to be answered. And by definition, for to answer this, this needs to be part of the political system of every country overall, because at the end of the day, it's more of an infrastructural discussion that we're having on that topic. On a final note, uh, the whole strategy that I tried to describe is agile in nature. So our plans for the future is to continue delivering services, which we haven't yet managed to do so, because some of them require larger procurements uh, rather than quick wins uh, and smaller services. But we're getting there. And at the end of the day, our goal is in 2026 to be digital by default. Again, thank you so much uh, for your invitation here, and I'm obviously much looking forward to the discussion. Um, thank you so much, and I think you covered a lot of territory there in a short time. Maybe I'll start where you ended. I think the, the, the speed and impact of your work um, is unique because it lies at the nexus of not only service design, design but they're also of lawmaking. I think you, you mentioned the 2020 law, um, and, and as uh, digital governance, the growth of service design, new teams and shops at the local and federal level across the globe advance, I think often this is thought of as a, um, as a separate entity from where we make policy at the, at the legislative body or in an administrative capacity. So I'd love to ask you to open that up a bit and talk about how much was, how, you know, the legislative powers you have which I can just, uh, we're in a virtual environment, I could just hear, uh, you know, 30 engineers and designers and policymakers say, you have total governance over contracting. <laughs> you, you know, you can, you can interoperate data. Um, these are kind of long in the United States. So many of them are interagency agreements to get a fraction of what the core powers are. But I, I'd love you to kind of tease out how much was the governance structure and the not bipartisan, quad part, you know, uh, you know, shared um, goal from a legislative body, mission critical to the work you've done. 
I'll answer this in a tweet. My legal team is equally big to my delivery team. Uh, and I think that speaks volumes about what we have been trying to achieve. The former president of Estonia, Thomas Hendrik Ilves, was extremely kind to act as an advisor at the, at the beginning of our tenure, and to me personally, and I always uh, try to find the opportunity to thank him for that. Uh, and one of the quotes, if he doesn't mind me quoting him, that he, one of the phrases that I remember from uh, his advisory capacity at the beginning was that w when we were designing this plan and uh, he was our, 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 let's say, closest person when we presented and said, does this work or not? He said that more or less your first year is going to be your year of legislation and the next years are your years of coding as a rule of thumb. You will need to legislate again and again and again in the process, but you need to get the legislation right. You need to get the responsibilities right. If you don't get them right, you won't manage to achieve the results that you want. Because in reality here, as you mentioned, uh, we're a very strong digital ministry. My colleague, uh, my Italian colleague, Vittorio Colau, who is the digital minister of Italy and the former CEO of Vodafone, we were at a conference in Italy 15 days ago, and he said that the Greek digital ministry is effectively the strongest digital ministry in Europe. He's right. Uh, we designed it, our prime minister and ourselves <clears throat> designed it as such on purpose because we wanted to get the results very quickly. Now, policies are like transplants. You need to have donor receiver compatibility. You don't have <laughs> a one size fits all approach. Uh, this wouldn't work in a federal system. But what we're trying to do and what we tried to do when we studied on that previous year, Estonia, the UK, the US, Argentina, New Zealand, Australia, what we tried to do was to be inspired by those, uh, I would say policy designs, and then try to get the lessons out of them and with a, an acute understanding of each domestic political system to have the optimum policy design for digital here. In a sense, you need, uh, I think that was, uh, that's, that's a quote from a, camp, from a political campaign here, but uh, anyway, it's, you need the knowledge of an insider and the mindset of an outsider in order to be able to deliver results in that manner. Um, Hannah? Thank you. I um, thank you so much for that um, presentation, which I have like a thousand questions for you. Uh, and I'm going to pick one to start. Um, as you were talking, I couldn't help but think about the fact that um, I would imagine that democracy, governance, and government it's are, are somewhat in the lifeblood um, for Greeks. And so that um, maybe citizens are coming from a slightly different perspective than um, in this country where we're all about privacy. Um, and um, and also maybe not as committed um, to certain forms of government. Um, I'm curious, to what extent do you think that um, the fact that that, that sort of that culture um, factors into all of the great work that you've been able to do? Like, is the appetite, would you say, for Greek citizens, um, it, is there maybe more of an appetite for experimentation or just a, like more of a core faith in government um, that we might not have in this country? In reality, uh, I think that, you know, our, uh, our strategy was delivery of services. And by that, I mean, uh, that overall we were trying to solve for a very large problem. So if you looked at any poll in 2019 and asked Greek citizens, what are the, like your top three or four problems? Excess bureaucracy was always topping that list, top three. So in reality, we're trying to solve for a chronic condition uh, that the Greek state has faced uh, since its conception. So this by definition, uh, replying to this, uh, to this challenge is by definition something that Greek citizens are endorsing. Every country has privacy concerns. In Europe, we have the General Data Protection Regulation, as you know, and uh, we have a, a very strong privacy regulator in Greece with whom we interact extremely closely and we try to check all our policies and all our uh, solutions with them so that they answer uh, the GDPR properly. But having said this again, if the problem that you're trying to solve is quite big, then I think that, that you know solving it is the answer itself. And this is why Greek citizens are endorsing this significantly. And part of the answer is also that this reform was quite unexpected. I mean, if you look at the dimensions of digital in the way they're measured by the various uh, indicators, indices throughout the world, effectively it's four things, right? It's digital public services, it's telecommunications, it's digital skills, and it's the penetration of digital in the private economy. 
So if we polled Greek citizens in 2018, out of the four, where do you expect to see most progress in the next four years? No one would reply in digital public services. Uh, so the, the unexpected nature of the reform plays a role as well. I think, uh... I think even with low expectations, you have, you know, you have um, gone beyond, but I think this, this point worth, is worth bearing a little more that globally, right, citizen trust in government, whether you're in Washington, D.C. Um, or in Athens or anywhere, is at a kind of epic low. For Greece, this was distinctly so, say, a decade ago, right? I am... I was reading last night a 2011 Transparency International study saw, you know, a decade ago, nine out of 10 Greeks, you know, believe their, um, their politicians were corrupt. I think the, the capacity to turn around here is worth like, st you know, stopping and meditating on. But I also want to ask you, you know, what are the signs you felt in, from tweets to the, uh, to the ministry to, um, you know, what's coming up in qualitative work that your service deliveries, what, what shows you that citizens are changing or do you have any, you know, connective data between trust in government and some of the citizen, service design projects? At this point, uh, it's more of a hunch plus certain data that we have in mind, like the polling that I mentioned before, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, acceptance of this policy of this government. It falls in, in the 70s, in the 70 percent. So the fact that people are endorsing this uh, in, ev in every poll that we look is obvious. But we have the same sense that you do, that this acts as a trust catalyst. Now, uh, in my previous capacity, I used to be the director of research of a think tank in Greece. And I remember implementing the World Value Survey for Greece. And we compare the data on trust uh, of the World Value Survey with other places like the Scandinavian countries in Europe or, or, or our close neighbors in the Mediterranean. And one could tell that Greece was quite low in the trust indicators. I mean, not only trust towards institutions, even societal trust. Uh, in our view, this is one of the core elements that we want to change in the coming years. Re-establishing the relationship between the citizen and the government and the state and, and the way the public sector works is part of that of the answer to this problem. So we feel that this policy acts as a trust accelerator, as I would say, uh, as a policy that induces trust, adds trust on behalf of the citizen. Um, but still, I think that we need to be extremely careful about you know, the delivery of this policy, because I don't know if, if you remember this game called Jenga, uh, <laughs> where it's very difficult to build the edifice and very easy to have it collapse if you remove the wrong brick. So one needs to be extremely careful about how those services are constructed and how trust is catalyzed and how you use, what, what, what vocabulary you use in the delivery of such services. For instance, you mentioned experimentation. Experimentation is generally not very, it's closer to, to the American culture than the European culture, I would say. Uh, but we need to learn to experiment. We need to learn from our mistakes. We need to learn from failing. It should be part of the design. It's the feedback loop. And we try to instill this in our vocabulary and in our communications with the citizens, saying, look, don't expect all services to be absolutely excellent on day one. They all have challenges. But if the system is built well, in 24 hours, we will have responded to the challenges also having uh, seen your feedback. Some systems, as you know from global experience, both domestically here and in every country, there are certain systems which never launch, uh, even though they have been procured and even though they have been designed for months. Our experience is that all our initiatives worked and worked well, and this is why trust was catalyzed. But you need the feedback loop. You need to be close to the people on the front line. You need to instill the culture of experimentation so that you develop this trust with the citizens. And I think that this is part, I would say, of my job description. And this is part of our role of our goals as Ministry of Digital Governance. So one thing that you mentioned that I would love to um, just hear a little bit more about are the citizen service centers. Um, you said that there are over a thousand and that they um, they act basically like a one stop shop for getting things like a driver's license or a birth certificate. Um, it's sort of a front door to government services. Um, so this is a thing that comes up often um, when we're like, who could who could do that here? Um, and it's often the post office, and then there's a or, or the motor vehicle, Department of Motor Vehicles, um, and then there's a conversation about what that might look like, and it sort of feels feels a little dreamy. Um, and this is something that like you've now had for um, I understand for 
quite a while and are about to sort of enter the next stage. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about um, how those uh, how the service centers came to exist and what's what's in the future for them. So the citizen service centers are a reform that uh, dates, uh, they're more than 20 years old, it dates in the early 2000s. It was one of the biggest reforms that took place uh, in the last decades. Um, they're viewed very positively by Greek citizens. They were the outcome uh, of the work uh, of one particular politician back then, Stavros Benos, uh, who designed them, conceived of them, uh, and started implementing them. And then all governments built on them. There was governmental continuity. Um, they never, though, materialized their founding vision. Their founding vision was that they would be the only place where a citizen would interact with government, as is our vision for GAD.gr, by the way. They never materialized this because around a thousand processes passed in the citizen service centers, but not all processes of the state passed under their remit. And this is manifested by the fact that in, I mentioned the birth of a child, uh, which was uh, the life event that we simplified, and it was a five-step process. Had they materialized their full vision, it would have been a one-step process of solely going to the citizen service center. So then there are certain life events that still require you to do 10 or 15 things. So overall, we plan to do more or less what we did in the vaccine. We plan to leverage them because in reality, what will succeed, I would say in every country, not only in Greece, is the multiple channel approach. You need to have digital, digital channels and you need to have physical channels for those who are not digitally savvy or in the life events where certain Phys your physical presence is required. I mean, in Estonia, you remember three things, for three things you need to physically appear in the public services, getting married, getting divorced, buying property. Some services will remain physical. So there you will need a physical one-stop shop. Uh, but apart from that, we plan to do in effect the vaccine model, which means, as we said in parliament, when we were delivering the vaccine service, we said the vaccine is not only about the vaccine, the vaccine is about everything. This was exactly the message that we were trying to convey. So overall, GAP.gr will be the new face of the state for all services. And the citizen service centers that we call KEP will be the equivalent uh, where physical presence uh, will be required or if you will want voluntarily to appear uh, in public services. I would love to talk a little bit about, I think you know, um, in the United States, President Biden in December put out an executive order um, on customer service, quite quite deliberately, I think not on digital service to the same point of meeting people where they are means to an end. Um, this kicked off a series of processes at a, at a bureaucratic level, including one which is at the front end of what you have been up to, looking at life experiences, birth of a child, leaving the military, turning 65. I wonder whether um, you have advice on the back end of a, folk, of a two year focus on life experiences for the, um, you know, the leaders at agencies who are at the front end of thinking these, or whether there's any specific story digging us into how you went from four touch points around birth to receiving a letter or an email, um, you know, either kind of stories from the field of birth, life experience in the Greek, and also advice to your, some of your peers and counterparts here in DC who are working on a similar effort. So the, the overall principle in redesigning uh, life events and uh, in changing the experience of citizens is that ideally that we should come to you rather than you coming to us. Uh, this is what we tried to do to, for the vaccine. That was the message, for instance, that if you're enrolled in the prescription system, you will receive a message. This is, by the way, another inspiration that we have from your book, where you mentioned the story of the citizens receiving uh, their ex via SMS an invitation to do their exams. Actually being inspired from your book and augmenting our e-prescription system, we plan to launch this this month in Greece. Uh, so uh, citizens will be receiving uh, invitation to do specific medical exams on the basis of their pre-existing conditions because we have a very interesting data set, as I mentioned, the, the prescription system data set. Now, overall, another lesson, which I think uh, is also part uh, of your work is that you need to have interdisciplinary teams. That's an absolute necessity. You mentioned that you need to have lawyers, you need to have economists, you need to have policy experts, and you need to have public interest technologies. Both engineers and people who know technology policy and public interest technology on the table, they don't, you need to know people who understand technology, not necessarily people who will write the code themselves. Ideally, you will have both. 
So for every life event that we were trying to redesign, we have an interdisciplinary mix of people on the table. Certainly at the end of the day, depending on the event, you need to have a business owner. So you need to have an organization that will have the ownership of the change or of the reform. On many cases, especially at the beginning, as we were trying to change this culture in the Greek public service, the owner was us and we were doing it uh, under the prime minister's directions. So effectively, we were trying to do this centrally, but after some point, after we managed to prove the concept, various organizations started doing it themselves. So we're there to catalyze this for them. They decide the what, we decide the how, uh, the mechanism through which this happens. And exactly because of the fact that Birth of a Child was the first change, I have many stories, most of which I cannot share, but uh, <laughs> amongst the ones that I can, even though the law was voted, even though the ministerial decision was signed, even though the, the technology was there and the program was there, it was a management exercise at the end of the day. And even though managerial books urge you not to micromanage, I had to micromanage in order to have the delivery of the service. So my office had to call all hospitals in Greece to check. Uh, they're not that many. I mean, give, given the size of the country, they're not that many, but we had we called all of them. We asked all of them whether the system is working, if they have comments. We told them that it plans to work tomorrow. We called all registries in all, in all relevant municipalities to see whether or not it would be working. We had challenges with certain amongst them. We had to call all of them and call them again and iterate back and find all the problems that they were facing so that the system would work. You know, making a policy decision, having a system created or having a law passed is not enough. All those are necessary conditions. The managerial equation and the implementation equation at the end is the sufficient condition. So in a sense, after you get everything right, after you have all the laws passed, all the policy shaped, the interdisciplinary team on the ground, then it's time for perspiration. <laughs> and then it's time to pick up the phone and see whether or not the policy is working on the ground and what you need to change so that it does. Um, I appreciate your candor, because I think, uh, and especially for those of us who are in the smoothing and moving um, into the internet era, the sometimes you have to call the hospitals yeah. is a good reminder of the tasks that lie ahead for our teams. I really do want to pivot, and I'm looking over at Hannah, um, to see whether there are some engaged questions from the audience um, to raise this up. But, uh, but just to anchor in the life experience here in the United States, and Hannah, I'm sort of queuing you up for audience questions um, next. You know, 40% of births in the United States are paid for by the US government um, because families are too low income. That is an actually a very sophisticated payment system. We independently have a, you know, quasi close to your, to your uh, benefit dependent $2,000, you know, or to, in your uh, Euro infusion. It's a tax credit, so you have to separately come back to us after your birth in tax season, um, where we do not file universally online, and prove to us that you're both a parent and that you're low income enough. But but it is a fully real realizable vision. Um, I don't think we you know no one has your powers of data integration, but that when a mother, um, you know, low income mother gives birth, we know who she is. We know she's validated for her child tax credit. You could send her in real time. Like these are not impossible dreams for us in the United States. I think thinking about what are what are the interesting openings where we have, as you thought, oh wow, the pharmacies are a, are a footprint. What are the footprints we have that we can envision life experiences differently? But there's a ton to learn, and I and I really I want to encourage. There is, I think, a bootleg version of your vision in English, which I'm happy to um uh, uh to make sure that some of the government officials here have a chance to look at because I think you are ahead at thinking through particularly this life experience of birth. Um, Hannah, are there are there questions from the crowd? I have plenty more questions, so if there aren't, I'm happy to use the, the chair of the mic, but do you have um, questions from? There, there are questions and I, okay. I know I'm weighing like, do I wanna just ask my own question or these are also good questions. Um, we got a question about um, how deep is the digital transformation in terms of re-engineering or even reinventing government or is it more the ripe of low hanging fruit in times of COVID? I would say we did both to be fully, to be full candid. So in a sense, part of it is extremely deep because if you look at the policy changes that I described at the beginning, the new organization, the, the powers that we endowed the ministry with, uh, all of those things are quite structural and they will remain so. But there are certain things which were absolute low hanging fruits and quick wins 
but low-hanging fruits remain low-hanging fruits until someone you know, grabs the fruit. Uh, so the, certain of these have been low-hanging fruits for decades. Uh, so in reality, and they were not because of COVID. What the COVID effect in reality was to catalyze the demand for certain services. But it helped that the delivery unit was there, the team was there, the, the responsibilities were aligned, the strategy was there, and the budget was there. Because what I should mention in this debate is that as we were structuring our digital strategy, the Digital Transformation Bible, we had a debate with all departments of the Greek government. And originally we conducted a gap analysis and we tried to see what systems are missing. So we had any prescription system, but most of Greek hospitals didn't have the systems that we would want them to have. So having seen the full gap analysis in 2019, we didn't, we purely didn't have the budget to do 100%, to cover 100% of the distance. And then COVID came and COVID helped especially there because there is a plan in the European Union called the RRF. Uh, and this plan effectively, budget-wise, it's a Marshall plan for our times, for the European Union countries. 20% of the plan in every member state of the European Union is budgeted towards digital. In Greece, it's 23%. What this plan did for us is that it enabled us to finance 100% of the outstanding elements of the past and even go into the list of things that we want for the future. So right now we have a very, I would say, coherent strategy vis-a-vis -vis what we're trying to achieve. Most of the low-hanging fruits have been delivered. So now we're in the, in the process of doing significant redesigns of services, which, of course, citizens are truly endorsing. Um, Chara, you want to? I also, I would just open it up. Please, please uh, submit your questions. Um. I want to ask a question about leadership, um, unless there that um, you have other ones ready at the ready. Um, in particular, I was really struck by the history of having a prime minister who saw the um, shortfalls and opportunities of the bureaucracy. In the book, we talk a lot about the importance of political leadership from the top, understanding the front lines. I, I just like to kind of tease out the ingredients of, um, you know, is can you do this at a technocratic level alone? No. <laughs> Tell us a little. Uh, uh, the, the answer, the answer, I think, the question is, uh, the answer to your question is obvious. You need both political skills and technical skills in this equation. Uh, and you need the vision, you need vision at the top, you need political leverage at the top, so it was very important that uh, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, our prime minister, had experience on that field and understood what was missing so that he wanted to create such a team that would deliver such a project. Uh, it wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, but having said this, when you go into the delivery unit and you go into how this policy is implemented, yes, when we passed the three policies that I mentioned, uh, the policy on data, the policy on the government platform and on the new services, on interoperability, on procurement, all of those things. One can think that we have all the cards in our hands. Yes, but this is not where the story ends. It's where the story starts. Uh, you cannot impose digital policy on other departments. It's very useful that we have the cards, but it makes the debate more productive and it makes, in effect, the outcome closer to fruition. But you cannot do it without other departments. You cannot do this without political deliberations. You cannot do this without an extensive iteration process. But at some point, the iteration process ends. At some point, someone makes a decision. And at some point, the policy is delivered. And this is why we decided to have this model to begin with. I want to um, open up for any more closing questions. Hannah, I can see you jumping in. Uh, yeah, we have a related question, actually, um, to what we were just talking about, um, which is how hopeful are you that the current momentum will endure in an in uncertain future, i.e. political changes, new policy directions, financial strains? Great question. Politicians are not good at making predictions, as you know. Uh, we should be good at making what we feel should happen, happen. So we should be good at delivery of results. So in my view, I, I view this question as a challenge. This is what I'll say. So in reality, we should try to guarantee continuity to the maximum extent. This is why we tried to get bipartisan support, even though we didn't need it. We have an absolute majority in parliament, but we wanted it not only for symbolic purposes. We wanted everybody's commitment towards this significant radical change uh, happening uh, at the core of our government, at the core of our state. 
So in reality, this is the core challenge moving forward. Um, I want to give you a, a moment to reflect on, you know, uh, in an unstructured way, if there if there's a single piece of advice you would give to your peers in Europe, to your peers across the globe, um, to us here in the United States as we embark on the smoothing of life experiences. Um, but before, so that may be my final my final question to you um, is your reflection is advice uh, to to others um, who may be at a much earlier stage in the chain. Don't even think for a single moment that you cannot do it. It's absolutely feasible to deliver the, the, this project, but the path for delivering it is singular. Each one has a different experience. The end goal is the same, what we need to deliver, but the path will be different for each one of us. We need to be inspired by one another. We need to learn from each other's successes and failures and to be very candid about uh, the latter. Uh, and, but at the end of the day, you know, if you do your homework, if you prepare in advance, if you have a good team which is interdisciplinary, if you have leadership at the top, as you mentioned, then you have all the core ingredients there, and then you can deliver significant change at that level. Um, maybe I'll close us out by saying when Hana and I were writing um, Power to the Public was around the same time when you were gathering um, an army of folks envisioning a new way that digital governance could take place in Greek Greece. And, um, there are three core pillars in how we talk about what we see as the kind of next level of work. Anchoring deeply in and designing for, for citizens, for residents. Using data in a way to say, oh, 80% of our you know, um, action is over here, or this is what matters most to citizens. Using data in real time to see how you're making progress. And the third is whether you call it experimentation or you call it trying and failing, or you have the ability to constantly learn, which I've learned a lot from you in this conversation, but I can see that you've espoused a culture of learning across the agency. Um, these are the hallmarks of what we say that kind of the excellent looks like. Um, you have built um, in your work um, a profound example of what we write about as should be done in the book after interviewing hundreds of people around the globe. So I'm excited for the Princeton Press is already on us about a next edition and I feel confident um, there is an ability to articulate the story of the work you've done um, in a moment, in a really important moment of crisis. So I really wanted to have the chance to say it's, you have some people working very deliberately on one of these three areas of the sphere, but the ability to say this is not at all about digital governance, it's about serving the public. Um, that this is a Jenga house and you could explain it. Um, you could do really excellent on your COVID rollout, but destroy something for the next generation of thing you haven't thought of. The level of um, sophistication of you and the team and actually the broader um, ministers is really, I think, inspirational, inspirational. And in a moment like now, um, where we're asking ourselves, you know, how can we be doing better at serving our citizens and in the United States? Uh, the answer is we have a long way to go. It's a real inspiration to have you here. I hope we will be in an ongoing conversation about what inspires you, um, what you what you failed at, what you succeed at. You are headed towards your goal in 2023. But I just want to kind of there's no in a in a remote environment there's no way to to kind of um, stand up as we would in the old days of New America and, and have um, some applause. But I want to express my gratitude to you and the team for sharing your learnings with us today. Thank you, folks. Um, we really appreciate it.